Hello and good morning. My name is Lodge McCammon and I'm so excited to be here in Augusta, Maine, delivering the keynote at the University of Maine System Faculty Institute 2016. And the first thing I'd like to do is give a big round of applause to Mina and BJ and the other, the other organizational team members for bringing me out and for putting on this day of learning. So let's go ahead and give them a round of applause. Yes, thank you. And that is our hashtag, hashtag UC Faculty Institute. Now, at this point, some of you might be wondering or thinking, whoa, the guy who's up on the screen there is also walking around the room. Why, why is that going on? Why is that happening? Well, I use this one-take video strategy that you're looking at right here. I've got my cell phone on a tripod. I've got some boards with some information that I can write on. It's one take because I hit record on my cell phone, I say what I need to say, I do what I need to do, I hit stop, and the product is done. It's a rapid way of creating meaningful classroom content that can be instantly reviewed, reflected upon, and shared, and honestly created anywhere. I am in my hotel right now creating this lesson content to deliver to my students who are you at the moment. So I'm using this one take video strategy to deliver lesson and lecture content to my students and one of the reasons, there are many reasons why I would use this strategy, but one of the main reasons is that it creates a self-paced learning environment. Self-paced meaning uh, I can create this one time and you, my students, can review the content anywhere, anytime, and as many times as you need in order to process that information. We'll talk more about that in a few moments as we move through this keynote, but the last thing I want to talk about is that I'm going to be running a Twitter contest over the next 45, eh, 43 minutes, and here's how it's going to work. My Twitter handle is at Pocket Lodge, like put Lodge in your pocket, and throughout the next 43 minutes, 42, I will be tweeting ideas, lesson strategies, research, uh, and videos, and every time you retweet one of my tweets, if you tweet at Pocket Lodge, or if you, you reply to one of my tweets, every time you do that, your name gets thrown into a hat. So the more you tweet, the more chances you have to win. At the end of the session, I will choose a name at random out of all those tweets, and here's what you can win. At the end of the session, I will be giving away a Manfrotto tripod, with a Joby grip tight mount. That's what I'm using right here, is what I'm looking at right here. Uh, and you can pop your cell phone in there. This is my, you don't get this cell phone, that's my cell phone. But you pop your cell phone in there, and it's a great tool for creating one take video in and for the classroom. So feel free to start tweeting now. If you don't have a Twitter account is totally fine. You can sign up for one. It just takes a minute or so. If you're not going to sign up for a Twitter account, that's totally fine as well. You can still find all the resources that I'm sharing today by going to twitter.com slash pocket lodge and scrolling down to all the tweets that have hashtag UC Faculty Institute. So let's begin. It's always fascinating to walk around while my lecture content is being delivered to see it from a different perspective, essentially cloning myself, because I walk around and I see who's paying attention and who's not paying attention. And I can sort of understand that. From up here, I don't, I don't really know. Students are very, very good at pretending they're paying attention. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then when you look what's on the screen, they're on Facebook. Yeah, That's all right. Change is hard. Change is difficult to make changes. Three years ago, I was out cutting my lawn. And I had an old, I, when I bought my house a number of years before that, I bought like the cheapest lawnmower you can buy. It was like 80 bucks, right? And I've been using it for a, a, many, many years, and it didn't ever work very well. It was one of those ones that like, you know, so there's something wrong with the filter. Maybe I should change the oil every decade. I don't know. There was something wrong with it. 
But I was out cutting my lawn. That's my new lawnmower, by the way. But I was out cutting my lawn with my old lawnmower, and my neighbor across the street has an amazing lawn. Like, he, he, he spends, like, 10 hours a week out there. He's just, oh, he just takes scissors to, you know, like, uh, I'm just, like, you know, it's 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday. I'm just, like, whatever. So he was out there cutting his lawn. I'm cutting my lawn. And we're very friendly. He's a real nice guy. His name is Daniel. And so it, he, he kind of engaged me in a conversation, so I turned off my lawnmower when we were chatting. And he said to me, he's like, man, you should, you should really get a self-propelled mower. And he rattled off a few reasons why I should do that. And as soon as he said, you should get a self-propelled, he started that sentence. I immediately was offended. I was like, well, I, what's my mower's? Well, do you, are you, my mower's just fine. Are you kidding me? I didn't even listen to the reasons. I was just immediately put off by him telling me I should get something other than I, what I have. And, it, and I took it to an extreme degree. Like, so he told me that. He wasn't being aggressive. He's just like, hey, you should probably do this because here are the reasons. Um, so we finished our conversation. I didn't let him know that I was you know, steaming about this. But uh, uh, after, so he walked off, and so I started my lawnmower back up, and I was pushing it. It was, you know, it was all messing up and stuff. And I was going through these ideas in my head, like, no, I, my lawnmower, it, it works fine. Why would I spend more money on it? Uh, um, it self-propelled. It probably, it, it's not self-propelled, so it probably, like, does better with fuel. Uh, uh, I get more exercise because I'm push, I have to push it up a hill. And I, I, was, I was going through all the reasons why what I currently have does not need to be changed. I was just listing those things off, which is borderline irrational, but like it's, it's, very, it's very typical. You know? It's a very typical thing that, that I tend to do when, when forced with, or faced with a change. So over years, three years, I kept using this this old lawnmower. And one of the reasons I kept using it is just to kind of prove him wrong. Like, I know I'm getting good exercise, and every time I went out there, I, I, I got to the point where there's something, I don't know much about machines, but there was something wrong with it. Every single time I used it, I had to take the spark plug out, take a, a toothbrush, and clean the spark plug to put it back in to get it to start. And then it would only run for about 15 minutes before I'd have to clean the spark plug again, which was incredibly hot. So I had to wait about a half an hour, let the spark plug cool down, clean it off, start it again, uh, mow for another 15 minutes. So I would be out there like running, like run mowing to do it as fast as I could. And, you know, so, uh, so three years after he told me I should get a self-propelled mower, finally, my mower died. I, it was amazing it lasted that long. I couldn't clean the spark plug enough or something. I don't know what. So I said, okay, I'm going to go look for another mower. I went to one of those places, Lowe's, Home Depot. I'm not getting money for either one of those plugs, so it could be either one. Nope, okay. Um, so I went in, and I, I was looking around and looking across the different mowers. I don't know much about them. And I saw, I saw this self-propelled mower. And I read about it, and basically the things that he told me about self-propelled mowers, that's what it said. And I said, ooh, that, that sounds great. That sounds like a really good thing. I should probably get that. And it's not very expensive. It's on sale. OK, great. Bought it, brought it home, put it together, used it for the first time. And I was like, oh my, oh yeah, oh. Right. And in that moment, I'm just, oh, this is so great. Everybody should have one of these. But when I went to buy this thing, in that moment, I determined it's my idea. It was my idea to get this. You know? And I held out for three years until it was my idea to make that change. Change is very hard. Now, I, I don't care about my lawn. I don't care about lawn mowing. It's, it's almost inconsequential to me. However, I still had this really powerful negative reaction to someone telling me I should change, even though I don't even care about it. My reaction should have been, yeah, OK, you're right. I'll go look at them. You know, I'll go check it out. No, it was not that. It was just this, this, this really powerful hold 
on what I was currently doing for unknown reasons. Now, I realize that education and teaching is very, very personal. Everybody in this room is very passionate about education and teaching. This is not a bunch of people who are cutting their lawns. Like, that would be easier to talk to. I'd just be like, hey, listen, it's really not that big of a deal. It's just your lawn. But teaching and educating is very personal. And everybody has their own way of going about it. Everyone is kind of uh, connected to the way that they learn, the way that they taught, or that they teach. So it's tough. Uh, to doing the things that I do is, is a little bit tough when it comes to change, because people have me come and talk to groups about, really, that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about ways of changing what's, what's going on in classrooms, potentially. Uh, specifically, uh, inspiring people to change, because I can't tell you to change. I am not your boss, right? So I'm, I'm just here to try to inspire you to change, which makes it difficult, because we're very passionate about what we're currently doing. And the more I talk to educators, like yourselves and other educators, um, it's a fascinating thing. It's so personal that many times the response I get when I talk about change is, oh yeah, I, I love innovation and change. I love those concepts, I love the ideas, as long as the innovation and change doesn't require me to change. <laughs> Right? Like if Daniel came down and said, hey, that's a really cool lawnmower. You're doing something super innovative because you're getting exercise and it's, you know, there's something wrong with the spark plugs. You're doing good. I would have been like, yeah, I like innovation and change. <laughs> but because he said, well, no, this is what you're doing is not exactly right. Now, but it leaves us with uh, a, a somewhat of an issue because I have to figure out ways of doing this inspiring the change thing. And one of the strategies I use actually came from dancing. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my colleague and I, Dr. Brandy Parker, who's going to join me up here on stage, we took 10 weeks of dance classes. And not just any kind of dance. We wanted to learn how to swing dance. Uh, specifically the Lindy Hop and the Charleston. And we approached dance class in somewhat of a different way. And we wanted to test out the use of this, what we consider a 21st century or modern reflective practice. Because we have these high definition cameras in our pockets and this concept of one take video. So what we did, we took 10 weeks of dance classes, we would film our dance class, which would be an, our dance lesson, which would be about an hour long. And then we would watch our dance lesson back in order to further process the information. And then we would make a short version of that dance class, the things we're supposed to be focusing on, essentially teaching ourselves the information. And then we would watch that. And then every few weeks, we would make a progress dance video of how we're doing. And then, of course, we would watch that back, too. So the reflective practice thing, or the model reflective practice idea, is that constantly filming ourselves, constantly looking at ourselves to learn how we're doing, how we're progressing. And over 10 weeks, we progressed, uh, from, for, according to our teacher and the other people in this dance community, sort of in an astonish, at an astonishing rate. Neither one of us, and somebody laughed. <laughs> I'll get it. Hold on. I just need a second. <laughs> Ma'am, we did a really good... No, okay. Um, yeah, we, we, we accelerated our learning using this concept. To, so we really knew ourselves and were confronted with actually how we did. Because we could have gone to these lessons and walked out of the lesson and been like, we are awesome dancers, you know, and that's it. Like, we don't really have... So anyway, um, what, what I wanted to demonstrate for you is is what the first lesson, when we f our first lesson, uh, I want to take you through just the beginning lesson, lesson of swing dancing. But I need you all to stand up for just a moment because I want to take you through this concept.
Now, something to pay attention to here is when we sit for a long time, blood pools down here. When we stand up, you, you heard it. Like, people are, oh, yeah, yeah, sm a lot of smiles. There weren't, I'm just saying, there weren't that many smiles about 20 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, so just, just the, the act of standing up just changes the whole vibe of the room. All right, we're ready to get down. We're ready to do some work. Get down. That was funny. We're ready to get, ready to get down. All right, let's do some dancing. But it's very simple. The first lesson we learned in swing dance class was the pulse, pulsing. And you'll see us pulsing here. All right, so you have a beat, right? And pulsing is take from your core a little bit of knees, you pulse to the beat. Pulse, pulse, pulse with me, pulse with me. Pulse, <laughs> pulse, pulse. And it's obvious why that's important, right? You have to. Because if you're trying to dance like this without pulsing, it's very tough. So pulse, it makes fluid. Pulse, pulse. Just a little bit. Doesn't have to be anything crazy. I see some crazy people in the back. <laughs> Settle down all over. All right, so pulse, pulse the beat. Excellent. And that's, that's basically it. So stay standing for just a moment. So we learned a lot of really interesting moves. And this video that we posted after 10 weeks, people basically said, how, I don't understand how you did it. But we had the evidence throughout those 10 weeks of all our videos to say, here's a playlist, watch our progress, right? We were very transparent about our learning and really our teaching, teaching of ourselves. But the most important thing I learned in dance class, or we, I guess we learned in dance class, had nothing to do with dancing, had nothing to do with pulsing. Oh, and by the way, the pulsing, pulsing, um, our instructor said, you got to really get used to this because I'm a musician, so all my rhythm is in this and this, right? My feet and my hands. So it's very difficult for me because I'm kind of like, I was like, pulse, pulse, no, 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 look. pulse, pulse, right? He'd say, okay, you got to get used to it. Pulse to the pulse in the grocery store, pulse, 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 pulse down the street, pulse, pulse, right? So I just I got used to it over time. Still not not perfect at it. But the most important thing I learned in dance class was this question, may I make a suggestion? And you might think, well, what, is, what does that have to do with anything? Well, swing dancing is a very social dance. You're expected to go to social dances, which are, is a big room with a live band full of two or 300 people swing dancing. And that's very stressful for me. Brandy is a much better dancer. What, I'm supposed to agree. It, um, she's a much, she, uh, she improved a lot faster than I did. I really struggled with it for a couple of reasons, one of which is because it was a social event. And I would get really stressed out because, put, put this mix together, you have a room of 200 people. If you're a, a, a dude or if you're a lead at one of these dances, you're expected to constantly at, dance with different people. If somebody's, what's your name? If Michelle is sitting down, look, looking around, I'm supposed to say, may I have this dance? And you, of course, you can say no. But um, you'd look at me and be like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I spoke for her. I'm sure that's what she would have said. But it was very stressful because dancing is a very cardiovascular thing. So you have very sweaty people. And I'm expected, no, seriously, uh, I'm expected to say, may I have this dance? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And then it's just like, oh. And I wasn't very good, so I was very, very stressed out the whole time. I'm just like, oh, I'm not doing a good job. But many times I would dance with expert dancers. There were a lot of great dancers in the community. And about half the time I would dance with expert dancers, the first step I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'm deficient. Like I, th this, oh, she hates that I'm doing such a, oh, I know like one move. This is awful. I feel terrible about this. And many times the expert dancers would want to help, help the novice dancers, because they knew, as, they knew as well that I was not very good. So about half the, <laughs> come on now, look at, look at the pulse though. Um, they, about half the time an expert dancer would say something like this. You know, if you would just like relax your knees a little bit and like kind of feel the pulse, I think you'd do a lot. Same as Daniel. As soon as she starts saying, you know, if you, you, should, you should just relax. I'm a massive failure. Like, oh, man. And then, and then it's just terrible. Then I'm trying to pretend to do like, uh, I just want the song to be over. <laughs> awful. Just an awful feeling. 
you know, if anything can get worse. And then it's sweaty, and it's not my sweat. Um, and then the other half of the time, a, an expert dancer would say something like this. May I make a suggestion? Totally different scenario. May I make a suggestion? Because I can say, no thanks. No, no, no thank you. Not, not right now. I'm doing, my th I'm doing my three moves. Doing my three moves. That's fine. No thank you. Or I can say, yes, sure, absolutely. Given the choice to say yes to may I make a suggestion allows me to open up my own mind to say, I am now ready for constructive criticism. If Daniel said, hey, can, may I make a suggestion about your yard? And I said, um, sure. I'll bet that he said, you know, it might be something to look into to get a, like, oh, okay. I said I was open to that. But being accosted by somebody just saying, you should do this, is a totally different situation. So take a seat, please. Therefore, may I make a suggestion? May I make a suggestion? Okay. So most of you said yes. Some of you did not. I don't expect everybody to say yes. Matter of fact, that's not going to happen. Some people are not currently open to suggestions. Totally fine. All right. For everybody still, though, um, my suggestion is this. As I talk about some of these ideas and issues and strategies over the next few minutes, consider them suggestions. All right? They are suggestions. I'm not telling you to do anything different. As a matter of fact, I want you to have the mindset of a suggestion in that your immediate reaction to something I model or talk about might be, this is not the way I do it. I don't want to do it that way. That's totally fine to have that. But for the next 35 or 40 minutes, I want you to put that aside and say, OK, that's fine. Um, I'm going to give you some time to talk to the person next to you a, a couple times. So have that conversation with the person. Uh, think about it. And then if you, if you talk to the person next to you, if you think deeply about it, try to figure out how you can make what I talked about work in your scenario, because I don't understand all your scenarios. Um, after you go through all of that and challenge yourself to try to figure out some way of making whatever I'm talking about work, if, if at the end of that you say, eh, probably still not working for me, totally fine. May I make another suggestion? Yes. Consider recording your lesson content using simple technology, one take video strategy, or even, I could still consider it a one-take video strategy uh, using something like Screencast-O-Matic. The concept of record, present, stop, the product is done. That's really the mindset of the one-take video strategy, getting away from extra steps. Extra steps means much fewer people are going to move forward with using video in the classroom. So very low barrier. I'm going to play this very short video about some data that I've collected. And then we're going to have a short discussion about it. We sent out a survey asking teachers who have recorded and published their lecture content to tell us the difference between how long a live lecture used to take compared to how long their video lectures are. And most of these teachers are, ha, have gone through the training program that we have created. Um, so we had middle school, uh, elementary, middle, high school, and college professors all participate in this survey. We had 127 teachers reply in total. And here is a summary of their responses. So in elementary school, the elementary school teachers reported that the average length of their live lecture was 23.4 minutes and the average length of a video lecture on the same topic that used to take them 23.4 minutes is 5 minutes. In middle school the average live lecture is 38.3 minutes their average video lecture is 8.5 minutes in high school an average live lecture is 37.8 minutes 
and their average video lecture is 10.5 minutes. And in college, their average live lecture is 54 minutes, and their average video lecture is 19.8 minutes. Huge huge benefits and efficiency from from recording your lecture content basically in elementary school the ratio is five to one for every five minutes you do live lecture that can be summarized in a one minute video for middle and high school it's about four to one and college is three to one the other interesting thing we're finding is that uh, so for college the ratio is three to one also for like faculty meetings staff meetings in school it's about a three to one ratio for uh, live talking compared to what could be condensed to a video and also professional development uh, is usually about three to one as well. And I was presenting at uh, for the Tennessee Arts Council about I think two years ago presenting doing a keynote for the Tennessee Arts Council and I didn't I hadn't made a video I just had this graphic and put it up on the screen and I got up live and talked about it and I have a video of me doing that live presentation in front of a group, in front of an audience. And that took me just under five minutes to present exactly the same information. So it took me a little, a little under five minutes. This video is a minute and a half long. So even, even in a setting like this. My question for you, and I want you to turn and talk to some people around you, three or four people is fine, just turn around. Um, have this discussion very quickly. I'm going to give you two minutes to have it. This is extreme. It's, it's extreme. Why? What slows down live lecture? What slows down what I'm doing right now compared to me recording it ahead of time and playing that video? What slows down live lecture? Two minutes with the people around you. Please go ahead. In 20 seconds, please. 20 seconds. I think it's turning on. Okay, thank you very much for your conversation. I know there was a lot of good stuff, and it could have continued for a little bit. And that's the transaction. That's the simple transaction of it. Instead of me talking about this content for five minutes, I play a minute and a half video. That frees up three and a half minutes for discussion. All right, that's the simple transaction, uh, the efficient transaction there. Now, I get to go around. Uh, I got to have a couple of one-on-one -on -one conversations over those couple minutes. I answered two specific questions. I decided those questions uh, were probably not relevant for the entire group. They were very specific questions for somebody's specific scenario. Um, so there are no questions I feel like I need to deal with. It feels like the conversations were, were solid. I can do that kind of formative assessment in the classroom to make sure everybody is on the same page or at least approaching that page. The first, so usually the conversations hit four different categories of what slows down live lecture. The first, the biggest one, is cognitive interruptions. And cognitive interruptions can be anything from, can you, will you please put away your, uh, nope, you're not going to? 
could you? What I was saying is that, really, can you put that away? Are you on your, are you on Twitter? You should be. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying is that, okay, so cognitive interruptions, we do this, right? We do this a lot. It chews up a ton of time, these cognitive interruptions, all the way up to, and I know this is, this is a tough one, but related and unrelated questions. I find in my classes, dealing with questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis, going around while discussion is happening, after the content has been delivered, handling those one-on-one -on -one questions is much more effective for handling related questions. If I hear the same question three times, I stop everybody and say, oh, hold on, let me address this. If not, which is usually the case, I can just answer those one-on-one -on -one questions and we keep going. I try desperately to avoid the one person in my class who will eat up a significant 10, 15 minutes of class every period with mm, questions that don't apply to everybody. I don't want to say unrelated questions, but questions that do not apply to everyone. I will not let somebody hijack my class with their questions. I would rather go and talk to them after, during every activity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation than them hijack the class. Because you know the other students in the class, when that student raises their hand and called upon, oh my gosh, I don't want that. That's the opposite of what I want in my class. We're like, oh, now I gotta get them back. All right, so the second is rambling and tangents. You know, oh, everybody looks, everybody looks tired, or I don't feel like you're, eh, I don't know, and I look, you know, uh, you look like you're bored. I'm gonna tell a story, ha ha, middle school. Um, you know, just go off on this thing because I feel like you bored or I feel like I need to do something. So we do, I do a lot of this, so the video helps me focus and helps me get through that core content. Uh, repetition, repeating. Again, over here, repetition and repeating things. And what did I just say? Repeating, repeating and repetition. A very common trend on a video. They can watch it as many, if you need the repetition, they can watch it as many times as they want. You just say it one time clearly. And then reteaching. Uh, for instance, hey, today we're learning about aggregate supply and demand together, but let's do a quick 15 or 20 minute overview of both aggregate supply and aggregate demand before we jump into the next topic. I don't need to do that. I have videos on each one of those. If you need to review those concepts, I don't need to stand up here and spend that time reviewing that information Live. So those are the four big pieces that slow down live lecture. And I heard everybody talk about all of those out there as I was walking around. So nice job with that. May I make another suggestion? Okay. About half y'all. That's good. No, no, no. It's all good. Be a producer of your classroom experience. Be a producer. I started playing violin when I was two years old. Well, I was a little tall. I was taller than. <laughs> Thank you. One person. Good. BJ. BJ. Checks in the mail. I started playing violin when I was two. And my mom was an orchestra director where I grew up in Chicago. So I played in an orchestra, a classical music. My dad was a record producer and had recording studios in Chicago. So I grew up in a very, very musical family. Throughout my young life and then up to this point, I continue to learn new instruments. So I'm considered a multi-instrumentalist. I play a, a number of different instruments. Over the course of my life, I've had, I've had the chance to work with a lot of creative individuals, uh, all other musicians as well. Uh, as I became better at playing music, I became more well-known and I became uh, connected with other people that were doing the same thing. And here are some of the people that I've worked with, all the way from producing uh, music with young children uh, and some of their ideas, to working with my niece Elizabeth on some of her original songs, to working with different, different artists, and either I would write songs and then produce the songs that I wrote for them to perform, or I would produce their songs uh, and work to make their songs um, kind of reach their potential. And what do I mean by production? When I say I'm a producer, uh, it means that my job is to create an environment that promotes creativity. 
right, to create a, a recording studio environment. So the, the artist walks in and it's just a seamless, you know, the, the room is a certain way and the technology is ready to go and I've got all the people ready and the track is ready. So all they have to do is be the best them. It's a super low stress, exciting, creative environment, right? Everybody produces a little bit differently, but that's how I approach it. Coincidentally, I approach the classroom. I try to approach the classroom the same way. But one of my biggest, oh, and how I know that I've been successful as a producer, my goal is very specific. How I know I've been successful is a creative person, at the end of a session, we finish a song, or listening to the song back, they're about to leave, and they say to me two things. One, I can't believe it's been four hours. It felt like 10 minutes. That was, oh, oh my gosh, the time just gone. Time just flies by. So that's, that's the first thing. Second thing is, this was better than anything I thought I could do. The value add was very high. So I create this environment so they create things that they never thought they could do. My biggest challenge has been to produce my parents. Both of them are musicians and they're getting a little bit up there in age. And two, a couple of years ago, we started working on a project called the 50 States Album. I'm, working on, I'm writing a song about every state in the United States covering the basic history, geography, and economic foundation. So I write these songs, and then they drive in from Tennessee. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. They drive in from Tennessee, and we record these songs together. And you're seeing one here, and I shoot videos and cut the videos together to, to show the process. Uh, this is a song about New Mexico that we're seeing here. And my parents are hysterical, but sort of a challenge to produce, because I want the same thing. I want them to feel like, wow, this was so much fun. This, the time went really fast. And uh, uh, this is better than anything we could have imagined, right? So I want to play you the 50 States album song about Maine that we created, that I wrote, my parents and I uh, recorded, and I produced them. It's called Vacation Land. ships from our lumber and fisheries iron and oil and need ended our golden age in the 1860s 
still have our summers, landscape, lobster, and waterway. In French, Acadia, English settlements were tried and given up. Then the colony of Massachusetts claimed it all from our Appalachians to the Atlantic Coast. And here is the way that life should be. Way here we go, yeah, directly. We should leave part of the compromise between King and Free, number 23. After our second stand here in Vacation Land. Here in Vacation Land. That's you. That's you. Aren't my parents amazing? <laughs> they are pretty incredible. They are pretty incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, so the one, um, the one question or the one issue here is, uh, that's great. So this concept of be a producer, all right, that's what it means for me in the recording studio. But how do I create that same environment for my students because that's what I want for my students. I want to create a learning environment that looks and feels like those kind of products, which is tough because working with two elderly people is hard, but working with you know a, a classroom of 200 students in an introductory psych class that I worked with uh, recently, that's harder, right? How do you create that kind of environment? And here is what I do. Here is how I go about creating that environment. This is a video about demand. I used to teach a, a college economics class, introduction, uh, introduction to macroeconomics, and this is one of the beginning lectures. Uh, this took me 45 minutes in the classroom. Like I would stand up and say, hello, here we go. Uh, this is a 15 minute video. So that three to one ratio again, a 15 minute video takes 45 minutes to deliver in the classroom. What I'm going to do, I'm going to play a very small chunk of this video. I'm going to play about two and a half minutes of this video, just the beginning. Uh, it's going to illustrate how I teach. I use a video like this. It's 15 minutes long. I play it in the classroom in small chunks. I'm going to play two and a half minutes. That's going to, just like that efficiency video, it's going to save me a bunch of time that it would have taken me to say the same thing. And then I'm going to have you do something. I don't know what exactly, but let me, uh, let me play this uh, a small chunk of this video, the first lesson embedded in here, and then I'll give further directions. One of my favorite comedians, Jim Gaffigan, has a bit where he talks about the $1 Big Mac at McDonald's, and he was driving past, and he saw that advertised, and he said, well, I, I don't want to lose money on this deal, so I'll buy 80 of them. He does a better job setting the joke up, but it gets at the law of demand. As price decreases, our quantity demanded increases. Uh, on the other side of it, as price increases, our quantity demanded decreases. It makes sense. As prices go up, we want less of things. As prices go down, we want more of those things. And this concept, this law of demand, can be illustrated through the demand schedule, or a demand schedule, and through the demand curve, which is our next economic model that we will be building. And then we're going to look at the difference between a change in quantity demanded and a change in demand. And we're going to use the delta symbol to illustrate this concept of change. So let's look at a demand schedule first. And I've created a demand schedule for a fictional product, and I'm going to call that product Grebes. And the demand schedule simply is a list of prices and then the corresponding quantities demanded at each one of those prices. For example, if in our economy the price per grebe, our fictional product, is five cents, then in millions the quantity demanded will be 400. So 400 million grebes would be demanded if the price is five cents per grebe. Now, according to this demand schedule, we can see that it illustrates the law of demand because as price goes up, price per grieve goes up, we should see that the quantity demanded would decrease, that inverse relationship, and do, indeed we do see that. We can look at it the opposite way as well. As price decreases, the quantity demanded increases. As things get less expensive, we want more of them. As things get more expensive, we want less of them. Now we can take this, these data. 
That was two and a half minutes of content. Would have taken me around six if I was delivering with cognitive interruptions, repetition, uh, all of those things. I've just bought a little bit of time. Now I can sit here and say, I just bought a little bit of time. What am I going to have you do? Well, at, every, at any opportunity, I try to get my students up and moving in some way. In a perfect world, we would watch more of that video and we would go take a walk. And I would give you some questions to answer. If we can get students up and moving, something simple like walking, it can increase their cognition. It can increase their attention, memory, creativity, and performance on whatever task we're giving them. Because quite simply, we actually have blood going to the brain. All right, now we're not going to go take a walk now because that doesn't make any sense for this room. Uh, what I'm going to have you do, we have, we have similar data that would suggest that simple exercise, all right, just some simple movements can start this process happening. So what I want you to do, I'm going to give you one minute, very quickly. I want you to stand up, get with the people around you. Hold on, let me give you the whole, uh, before the insanity starts. People around you, I want you to kinesthetically demonstrate that content. How could you use your bodies to illustrate what that content was about? If you don't remember the content, hopefully the person next to you does. OK, st stand up. <laughs> One minute. So, hi everybody, come back to me here. Yeah, go ahead and sit down if you'd like, that's fine. This is how, this is how I produce my classroom. This is why I'm a producer. I create experiences for my students. Very, very simple. Nothing complex about what I just did. But how I do this is I use video to make my presentation extremely efficient, getting, getting through that content. Matter of fact, I walk in the first day of my class and I say, I have said everything I need to say about the content. Now it's time to get down to work. And getting down to work does never, it really rarely means me standing in front of my students and talking. It means producing an experience for them. I play a chunk of video. So they have that information right there with them. I challenge them to do something with that content. And movement, it, it's, for me, that's the best way I've found to produce an experience for my students. As soon as you were up and moving, it was, it was fun. It was exciting. People were having a good time. Because I want to produce an experience where my students walk away and say, the time flew by. I did, that, was, that was 45 minutes? That was awesome. Like, that was great. And we got to do things that I never thought that I'd be able to produce. I, I would get to create things that I never thought I would get to create. So may I make one last suggestion? Yes. One. Produce just one. I know this seems overwhelming. Uh, what it seems that I'm saying is do this for all your lessons, all your classes, implement it all across the board. One. Produce one lesson for your students and try it out. Meaning, create one content video. You use some way of slicing it up, deliver it to your students. Then do some movement-based activity or get students to create some artifact of their learning to teach that information, to demonstrate their understanding of that content, teach it back. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you.